welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's special guest is Giancarlo Zuliani. He's a facial plastic surgeon in private practice in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Now, he focuses on rejuvenating, restoring, and reconstructing the face do surgical as well as non-surgical procedures. Now, Dr. Zuliani completed his general surgery, residency, and chief residency at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. And he completed a fellowship through the AAF PRS. Now, he's a speaker at other medical conferences, as well as a member of several medical societies. So, Dr. Zuliani, welcome to Beauty and the Biz. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So you have a pretty fancy name. Um, did you get that name in Detroit, Michigan? <laughs> Are you? Well, uh... Yeah. So my uh, dad's an actual immigrant from Italy. Right. And so he came over the age of eight. And uh, my mom's not Italian. And so, you know, they're trying to decide on names. And, you know, Steve didn't work really well with Zuliani. So, you know, they, they made it a little bit more Italian sing songy. Now, do you speak Italian? I do. I do. Is that is that helpful to have in Detroit, Michigan? Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I know you were in the hospital setting for a long time. And one thing the audience loves to hear is the journey from um, hospital, insurance, et cetera, versus private practice, cosmetic. So could you just quickly go through how what was that like for you to jump from one to the other? Sure. But coming out of fellowship, you know, everybody's sort of... Um, unsure of what's going to happen. A lot, a lot of people don't want to take on that big financial burden right off the bat. So you'll enter in some sort of agreement with the hospital. Myself, I went in with a academic practice, which was a multi-specialty group um, based out of multiple hospitals, not just one hospital. Initially, I was given a lot of leeway in terms of doing what I wanted to do. So I can mix aesthetic work with um, insurance cases. The, the majority in, early in my career, obviously, were insurance cases. Um, and it came to a point of probably about four to five years in where my cosmetic practice was picking up. However, the mindset behind the academic group was not one of a private practice mindset. It was not business oriented. It wasn't patient oriented per se. And so at that point, along with other hiccups that happened along the road, which are many and don't need to be explained here, but convinced me that I needed to do this on my own. And really, you know, once you get that mindset of doing it on your own, you just have to make that decision to get off the couch and do it. And so that happened about six to seven years in and took about two years of planning, probably, to get to a place where I wanted to be, you know, starting with where I wanted to open up shop, um, who, how I wanted to construct the practice, you know, how to build it the way I envisioned to build it. And so it took a lot of planning. It took um, a lot of investment with my wife and I in terms of seeking out people uh, around the country as well as in my backyard to see how their experience went with opening up their own practice, you know, securing financial backing for it and um, working with established relationships in the community as well as with my vendors to support the practice. And since that time, it's been... Um, you know, it's, it's the most work you ever put in, but we've come to a point where it's booming and um, obviously aided by the uh, COVID surge and things like that. But it's it's been very uh, humbling to know that it's been so successful. So back to the multi-specialty practice, what I find is when everyone else is in insurance, you become like this, not even a prima donna, you become um, like, I'm not helping him. You know, so a lot of times you join thinking, oh, well, this is my lead gen. You know, this is where the leads are going to come from. And, and then you're sorely mistaken because a lot of your colleagues who don't appreciate the aesthetic side for whatever reason, um, they turn out not to be your lead gen source after all. You have to grow it on your own. Um, but what like psychologically, how much courage? Because I think it takes a ton of courage. But um, the key word there was decide. Right. Once you decide, you can now make solid decisions with a plan. Until you decide, you're still waffling. Um, how long did you waffle? Um, well, I, at the there, there was a couple incidents that happened that made me convinced 
or convinced me to to do this. Uh, they some, have to. It takes yeah. that. Yeah. So and you know, one was an incident of um a patient's information being um, stolen by a front desk member, you know, you know, things like that cannot actually happen. So that that was, you know, around the age of I think I was 40 or so. And then I made my decision like at 42, I'm opening up my own doors. I, I, I made a promise to myself. And so that happened. And, you know, you are right in terms of, you know, initially they, you know, the, the, the practice and the plastics practice within our division was was going well. However, it takes a certain amount of money to sustain it. And you'd have to pay people and you know purchase a laser or any sort of other medical equipment, as well as the oncurring costs or recurring costs of injectables and neurotoxins. And the other members didn't understand like why the overhead had to increase so much, but they had no problem taking, you know, 60% of what I brought in, plus a dean's tax um, of what I brought in. And what I brought in was more than most any other person. And I couldn't, and they judge people by RVUs. And, I, you know, my RVUs are, it's dollars, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a indication of work. It's an indication of what people think I'm worth. And so uh, it became sort of a, you know, a, a head butting, you know, like, should we support them or should we not support them? And, you know, a lot of people try to convince me, even the head of the practice said, oh, you're, you know, you, you can't do this on your own. You'll never succeed. And so th that's all. I know when people and, then, say that. And, and, and they said that to me and I, and I, and I kept that in the back of my head. That's and all the motivation you need. Exactly. When there's none left, you fall back on that. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, um, but you, you you have to you have to get up off the couch. You have to just decide and do it. When you did, and thankfully you have a wife that supported you doing this, because that can also be a very big challenge. Right. If the wife is not behind your decision to do this, it just you know it, it triples the, the the stress of it. Exactly. So, so how how in the world do you go about finding a location? And then do you decide I'm just going to rent? I'm just going to rent from a hospital? No, I'm going to get away from the hospital. I'm going to go into a uh, like a um, consumer setting. Right. How do you decide? Because lo is location as important as it is in real estate? Um, uh, to a degree, but it was more important in terms of my lifestyle. To tell you the truth, so I wanted to pick a place where you know I have young kids and I could be close to my home and close to the school that they attend. And, you know, I, my office is literally a quarter of a mile away from my house. So it, that was a, a big plus. The um, area is, it just happens that this area also has a lot of plastic surgeons around. I wasn't scared by, you know, having six, you know, competitors, quote unquote, around the, around the, um, around the street or around the block from me. So it was more convenience to tell you the truth. But now we're in a, in a spot where, I'm growing out of this facility and I'm looking to purchase my own building, which is really a struggle because um, things are just overpriced these days. But I would think there's a lot more con um, commercial space now. Didn't that, when the demand of that decreased, did that help? The to, yeah, no? to a degree, except for things that are zoned medical. Things that are zoned medical are still at a premium. People who are, you know, you know, corporations, you know, which may not be using them. Like, you know, we're big in auto around here, which may be pulling out. The only thing that's really hot still is medical because people need to go see their doctors. So it is, um, it's been a challenge. And so, you know, we're tackling that one. Uh, so I've got my goal on that one for two years and we're, we're cranking ahead on that. But in the meantime, you have to work with these hospitals. Are you having trouble booking? I know you did during COVID. Has that settled down? Is um, thankfully, my my relationship with my you know outpatient surgical center and hospitals has been very very good, and I've been loyal to them since the beginning, and so I've had built in block time, and they've really worked around helping me get all my cases in. You know, there was you know staff shortages everywhere, and nursing shortages everywhere, and they had to pull back on uh, rooms and amounts of cases you can board. But thankfully, they, you know, worked with me where I didn't really have to um, pull back a lot. So that's been, thankfully, I've, I've heard horror stories otherwise, but thankfully, that's been the case for me. I literally have had calls from surgeons who had to cancel surgery the next day because the, they didn't have staff. Um, they yeah. just, 
it was like, what happened to our industry? When did all of this go sideways? I mean, that along with the shortages of lidocaine and saline in the, in the country, it's sort of like, what else can go wrong? The supply chain issues are just so plentiful and so complex. It's hard to it's hard to run your own surgery center. It's hard to go to the hospital. It's just there's just not enough supplies, nor there enough you know manpower to to meet the demand. Right. Um, you touched on, on the car, the auto industry. Um, I know Detroit. I'm actually originally from Chicago. I still okay. have the accent, um, <laughs> so I'm wearing yours as well. Um, right. But yeah, so, how big of a deal is it? How big a deal is the auto industry? Does that ruin you if they walk away, if they leave? Or, or what's your situation about that? Um, not necessarily. They're still the biggest um, provider of jobs, I believe, in, in the city. Right. That along with all the other ancillaries, like the, the different tier um, you know, suppliers and, and supply chains like that. But I think um, Detroit's be- become a little bit uh, a, more of a little bit of a renaissance recently. The, the restaurant scene has been booming, the real estate market, and well as um, two huge real estate corporations, mortgage companies, Quicken and United Wholesale Mortgage have been really fueling sort of a, a comeback in this area. So it's not just strictly related to auto anymore. And now that the big three are getting involved in uh, more electric cars and more technology. Um, I think they're diversified enough where they they're not going to hit another two thousand and eight where they need a, a bailout. Let's hope. Back it. then it was bad. Back then it was it was pretty bad. Um, you also have an incredible mall called the Somerset Mall. <laughs> right. That is that is a, a half mile away from my office. They literally, like Google, will call it a, an attraction. You know, right. <laughs> it's like a tourist attraction. What exactly. do you, so is that where you all hang out, or it's well, really beautiful? Not really. I mean, so Michigan is more of a you know, it's a four season state. Um, you know, spending time outside and doing boating and, you know, golfing and tennis and, or going up skiing uh, to up nor- uh, northern Michigan. But it's really more of a uh, all seasons type state, you know, so I don't I don't really hang out at the mall, but um, hanging out outside for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's but it's a beautiful it's a beautiful mall. I mean, oh, it, it, I mean, it is. It's it, you know, it rivals, the you know, the best in the, in the country. Right. And yeah. it's under a roof that's just spectacular. I must say, I, I, your mall was very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so are you completely cosmetic now? Yeah. So um, when I opened up my practice, I still would see some Mohs reconstruction, things like that. But one year in, we stopped. It was just too busy cosmetic wise. And so we gave up all insurance carriers at that point. And my cases are purely cosmetic now. All right. So now this is what happens when you're a facial plastic surgeon. Typically. You can live off of, you know, from the neck up, there's plenty of business there. Right. Normally. But a lot of you also want to keep that patient for a lifetime. And you you bring on the non-surgical as well. And I believe you have done that as well. So how important has it been to do surgical as well as non-surgical? And do they complement each other and build a practice of people who return and refer? Right. It's a, I think it's essential. So uh, we have, you know, um, multiple providers in the office doing, you know, energy-based treatments and injectables, um, full body injectables, full, full body treatments. Um, and so, you know, I can't scale me, but I can scale that type, that business. And we brought on more estheticians and more injectors to, to help with that. So, it's a, it's essential and the and the play between the two is is seamless so you know i'll say hello to their patients even if i've not not met them before when they're in the med spa and i'll i'll peek my head in and you know it'll be you know i think it's time for surgery so they'll schedule a consult with me or i think you need to go see the estheticians for x y and z or go see the nurse injector uh, you, perhaps you're not a, the best facelift candidate but if you want something to tide you over maybe have a consult for sculpture or threads or or things like that, and you know, it's it's. I think it's important to have a varied menu of services to offer people, which which have each of their own separate downtime and each of their own separate price point. And it's our it's not our business to tell people where to spend their money, but it is our business to tell them and educate them what each procedure, non surgical or surgical, 
can do and what their expectations should be. And so we want to build a, a treatment sort of pathway for them and allow them to sort of choose where they go. And it's sort of like a, a branch on a tree. If I do this and I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. But I'm lucky. I mean, I still have patients who followed me from my original practice who still come and see me all the time. So building those lifelong relationships and then, you know, their friends and their friends, it's been more of a word of mouth type of thing for me um, than anything other. Well, I know um, just coming from the, the patient perspective, most patients, I will say, generally speaking, don't jump into a facelift. They Correct. take little bit steps, little steps to get to that facelift, but it starts easy. Um, and typically that's where your esthetician comes in, then your nurse injector, then the laser tech and right. all arrows point to surgery. It's just let them have surgery when they're emotionally ready for it. And in the meantime, develop that relationship. Um, I just think that's really smart business in today's world. Starting over every single surgery would be exhausting. And oh, some sure. do. You know, some say, you know what, I'm just a surgical practice. And I think, okay, then, keep, you know, yeah, we'll find a bunch of surgery, surgical patients, you know, it's right. going to You know, everybody who comes in, there's something to offer them later. Now, if once somebody has surgery, it doesn't necessarily mean they're done, right? It's, you know, you want to keep them in your practice and keep their results up. And that requires further techniques and further procedures. You know, you know, you want to keep things tight and you want to keep looking good and you don't want to just go run out and bake on your boat and, you know, burn, right? That, that's not the way. But that's the American way. We destroy, <laughs> we destroy ourselves for decades and then we say, hey, could you fix this? Exactly. <laughs> you got five hours, fix it all. Yeah. And then the clock's ticking, so hurry up. Um, right. so I know you have a lot of lasers. Do you have any words of wisdom or pearls about how to go about buying a laser? Um, I'm just hearing so many stories about them. What, what do you think? Well, it's, um, you know, I, I'm, I won't be the, I won't be the first to jump into anything that's really new. And they're saying that it's hot and it comes with, you know, a lot of flashing lights are there. I mean, the flashing lights are there to draw you like a moth to a flame, you know, it's, so you have to do your own research and talk to your colleagues around the country to see what is really the most bang for the buck. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and spend $350,000 on a huge platform, but perhaps you start with something smaller. And the other thing is everything is negotiable. Um, don't feel like that is the price that they give you is the price that it's going to be. The, these companies, for the most part, want to keep you as a lifelong purchaser as well. So they realize that, um, you know, I will make calls to certain people suggesting certain things here and there. Um, but you really got to stand behind the technology and the company as well. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge investment to begin with, but it reaps its benefits for sure. Um, mostly because the patients are recurring, the, the price ticket on them is not super expensive. And depending on the type of laser, the downtime isn't the worst, but working with a good company, which is, which puts their sort of heart behind your practice and really wants to support your practice is valuable. Um, I've, I've seen other companies where, you know, the last you see of the, you know, the salesman is the second they deliver it and then they're gone. But you, you know, I've worked with some companies where that's not the case. Well, I think the better companies, um, they, well, they should be helping you market the darn thing. For sure. A solo practitioner does not have the time, money, or wherewithal to um, do patient education. That's not your job. Um, it's their job to <laughs> drum up the consumer demand and exactly. then your job to be the supplier of that demand. So um, I want a company that backs you up like that. Like what kind of practice building tools and strategies and budget do they give you to make sure this thing hits the ground running? Because right. a lot of times I have to say the practice, um, when it doesn't go well, they do blame it on the laser company. A lot of times, um, it's not magic. I mean, somebody's got to market the thing. Either right. you do or they do, but somebody's got to have a plan in place to make that work. Um, have, exactly. have, you, have you noticed that when you bring a new laser on board? Do they? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, so we, we have, luckily, I have my own in house uh, social media people. So I think that's exceptionally important for anybody transitioning because it's a way that you can market on. A sort of a, a low budget without having to put up major ads on radio, print, or television. And you just have to you have to grow it organically. It's a it's a slow thing, but once you get the uh, appropriate patient base and then 
using sort of you know clickbait for Facebook or things like that or on Google Google Ads, you can attract new people in for your for your new um, your new platform that you're going to be bringing on. And then you have to do a lot of education about it too. You have to get on the you got to get on the camera. You got to talk about it. So how excited you are treat the staff, have the staff tell them, you know, what it feels like, what expected results are. But it's, it's a lot about just marketing and internal marketing obviously is the best, right? So you want to keep talking to your existing client base who already trust you for, you know, trust in their face in you. And you want to keep telling them what's coming up, what's, what's new, what's, uh, what's coming up. And, 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 it, and it'll be successful, but you can't just buy and expect it to sell itself. That's not the way, that's not the way it works. You have to invest time and you need the company to help you too, whether it's they're doing direct to consumer ads or they're giving you a certain allowance to pay for putting these ads out. It needs to be sold for right. sure. Here's my pearl on that. If they're paying for it, then sure, they can use their name. Otherwise, if you're paying for it, I would get away from the name of the treatment or the laser, and I would only talk about pain solution. Um, you have sun damage, we wipe it out. You know, you, you give me, you, there was this ad before, you give me five days, I'll give you five years. Right. That was brilliant. Nobody needs to know how. Right now, they're in advertising, they just need to know the what. You know, they have a problem, you you have a solution. The details come in later. Um, so that's what I would do. You know, just, right. that's the, that's good. Websites are built like that. You know, what's, what's your problem? And this is the treatment, you know, like brown spots, melasma, you know, and then, then you can go into what you can do for it rather right. than say, I have X, Y, Z laser or X, Y, Z radio frequency, a micro needler, you know? Yeah. They can pay for that. The, the exactly. vendor can pay for that. You <laughs> do for problem solution. Um, exactly. So let's just talk about staff because staff is always the biggest challenge. I'm assuming, I mean, you look like you have a lovely staff. You took them water skiing. I mean, everyone should have been happy with that. Um, so, <laughs> so what pearls do you have for uh, just bringing the right staff on board, surrounding yourself with a good team? Right. Obviously that, that is, that is the, the hardest thing for sure to get people to buy in. And from early on, we have, we had a really good core group that are still with me today. So a lot of it is giving them the reins to be creative and to have a certain amount of graduated responsibility, having their uh, see a path of growth, um, meeting with them regularly, meeting with the team regularly, going over individual as well as corporate goals. Um, and then having fun together as well. It's, I think it's important to, to go out as a team and try and connect with people on a, a personal level, you know, and getting to know about their families and about their background and, you know, their inspirations rather than just having it be a pure check in, check out where, you know, everybody's sort of living in their own silo and nobody really cares about the sort of common goal. And that's what we're all, you know, we're, we want a team, right? It's not, necessarily a family, but it's a, definitely a team that you want to build and have some people rely on each other. And it takes work. It's not easy. It's actually the finding people and retaining people is hard. Um, and it, But it's a lot cheaper than recruiting. I'll tell you that. So, you know, it's, it's important. And, you know, with inflation, you know, people need to be paid too. And so, if you have a if you have an employee that is just so stellar, make them feel that way because it you know without them, if you're going to be hurting, pay them accordingly and treat them accordingly. But how did you get it right from the beginning? Like you hired some really killer people. Well, I had a I had a consultant, and I my wife's background is in HR, so she oh, knows. Oh, hello. That. Yes. Yeah. So she was oh. an HR she was an HR director at one of the big three. And so she knew sort of the ins and outs of how to do this. She wrote my employee handbook. I mean, without her, it would have, you know, it would have been too much work for myself. Well, I hope she got a stipend out of that. Yeah, <laughs> she got a couple of nice bags. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, but, you know, w with that, it, it was a continuous work, but we found the right people and, um, it's worked. Now, have there been hiccups with other employees? For sure. And COVID did not help that. Um, so, you know, it's a constant process um, of trying to find people. But I think right now we've, we've we're, we're hit a groove where we've re we're really getting along as a, as a team and attitudes are great. So 
but you'll go through ups and downs and ins and outs and you just have to weather the storm and be able to be positive about it and take your time to to hire the right person well i know i'm prejudiced but i'm from the midwest and i think the best working minds come from the midwest the work ethic the blue collar, whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. Um, I moved from, I couldn't get out of Chicago fast enough, quite frankly, I I couldn't do the weather. I just couldn't. So I wanted to go to San Francisco and that, wow, talk about culture shock. Anyway, (laughs) another story, but um, out here, nobody did anything like compared to Chicago. I mean, I was so disciplined and I didn't even know it. I worked so hard and I didn't even know it, but I thought, Oh my God, I'm going to be a, a big hit out here because I'm actually willing to get to, to the office by eight when nobody else was showing up till nine 30. And I, I was just so surprised. So frankly, I think, well, the wife being an HR killer, <laughs> killer strategy. <laughs> and the next one is you are definitely in the middle of the Midwest where they have, they think differently or they used to anyway. So, well, I mean, I, there's some, there's some grit, you know, there's some grit yeah. involved in Detroit's, you know, sort of a roll up your sleeves and let's get it done. You know, even the, the, the basketball team was let's, let's go into work was their motto, you know, the Pistons. Yeah. So it's, it's a blue collar town, but people definitely put the work in. And if you put the work in, you'll, you'll reap the benefits. It was it's very hard to get started and get the inertia going when starting a practice. But once it starts rolling, you know, you don't have to push as hard. You can just sort of nudge the rock along. You got you constantly have to do it, but you're not going to be bearing, you know, the huge, you know, three pound, thousand pound weight trying to roll the stone up the up the uh, mountain. Uh, eventually, it becomes a little bit easier. But you but you gain people with you to help push it, right? So you're getting a team to help push it everything along and 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 help progress the the corporate goals and the practice goals. But you already said it. You meet with them regularly. Everyone chipping in. You work together as a team. You're not best friends. I don't. I'm that can go sideways sometimes. Right. Um. But but definitely, just knowing that you care about your staff makes them work harder for you. That I know for a fact. For um, sure. And then, for sure. But sometimes though, some some of the surgeons like they'll have a Christmas party at their house, and their house is unbelievable. And um, sometimes I think that can backfire on you (laughs) yeah i mean we've always done it elsewhere our our parties and things like that but you know we were i mean my wife and i just went away to london recently but we got everybody like a little you know union jack like little card carrier thing you know it's just it's not nothing crazy expensive but it's the thought and you know you would have thought you know we'd have bought people faberge eggs you know everybody (laughs) was like so excited um but it's just a it's the thought and you know recognizing that you're uh you know they're on your mind and um that makes people feel good oh uh, that's fantastic most surgeons would not even think to bring their staff back something it just doesn't <laughs> occur to them um right. and that's because they treat their staff like overhead and not an asset and right. uh, i think you watch some of my videos because you and i are thinking the same way about right, right. <laughs> boy you have to hang on to them and when you have a great staff there's nothing better been a well-oiled machine there's right. nothing better when everyone's doing their thing and you're all working together for the good of the practice not for yourselves <laughs> um nothing it's just you know that's how to do it if you can and then of course as soon as it, it all works out then somebody has a sudden i have to move to alaska because my husband was transferred and it all falls apart but <laughs> <laughs> that's happened i mean we've had people like that they've had to be transferred and so yeah you go through periods of like, am I ever going to get out of this rut? Am I going to find somebody? And then it happens. And, it, you, you know, you know, the sun shines another day. It, it, it'll be okay. It all works out. I yeah. and my, my motto, especially when you get older, you're like, you know what? This can't all be drama, drama all the time. You know, right. like, all right. It, but it does seem to happen in, in clump clusters. It you does. know, like it all falls apart at the same time. It's like, really? Like, really? What, and my why? staff will say, uh, Mercury's in retrograde again. Watch out. You know, so there'll be you know, three or four problems happening. Like, what is going on? You're like, and you're then, you know, better. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So let's talk about marketing because you're doing something that I have been talking about for de- two decades now. Make a signature treatment with your net- initial on it. So sure, right. enough, you have the Z lightning lift. That's right. So, can you talk about that? So yeah, it's a it's a uh, minimal access um, facelift procedure, sort of hybrid using radio frequency as well as sort of deeper plane tissue techniques that is done under local anesthesia only. Um, we call it lightning lift because it's done 
quicker. The recovery is quicker. Um, we're using radio frequency plasma, which is what lightning is. And so um, we use the specific modality. I didn't call it by its name. I just created my own little thing. It's an own little niche surgery. Is it for everybody? No, but there are certain people who are, you know, in between fillers and a formal facelift that just want something that's minimal, but gives them the refresher that they want. And um, we came up with that like year one, and it's been a boom. People will search it up and say, am I a candidate for this? Am I a candidate? Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't. <laughs> they're they're a, little, a little bit older, and a lot of people can't handle just plain local anesthesia. But in the right person, it it works really well, and they appreciate not not having to go to the surgical center, not having to go under, not having to pay those additional costs, and having you know great results without all that downtime. Uh, I think that's just genius. Um, a lot of women cannot admit they need a facelift, but they need a little something something. Right. Um, that's why they're attracted to that. If I'm not mistaken, did the lifestyle lift come from Michigan? It, it did. did. It came right through three miles down the road in Troy, Michigan. Okay. Because I'll tell you, I don't care what you say about them. They were talking right at the consumer. Right. No stars. It's a Band-Aid, not a bandage, you know, like round your head. Um, no down, Minimal downtime, minimal scarring, minimal everything, local. I mean, it, they were it, that was music to women's ears. You know? right. Right. I can give an awful lot of result for a lot less. Less money, less time, less hassle, less pain, less scarring. And um, so I'm assuming there's some of that came from that. That's just genius. Yeah, yes. Uh, a, a lot of it was trying to find that sort of that niche and that where people, you know, were in between. And, um, and so that's what we, we aim to, to capture there. So how do you use that in your, because frankly, you can use it in all sorts of different ways. Um, there are women, have you noticed the women are getting younger and younger who want facelifts? Oh, I mean, it's, it's oh, yeah. extraordinary. I mean, if we're getting into late 30s, <gasps> mid 30s. A lot of people are like, I don't want to be burned out on filler. I'm just going to, or, you know, threads or whatever it may be. I'm not just going to invest in it now. And so what we did one on a 36 year old a few weeks ago. Um, and that's where the lightning lift comes in. I'm like, okay, let's offer you this. That doesn't mean you're not going to have a secondary lift 15 years from now, but this will tide you over. Right. Um, so yeah, but more younger, younger, I just, you know, I was just you know, saying hi to a patient who was receiving a, an energy-based treatment and she was like is it ready for my facelift yet and she's you know she's 44 and yeah. i'm like she's like i just want to get it over with i'm like i understand it's it's, it's happening younger and younger and younger and i think a lot of it's due to you know people are seeing they're not scared of surgery anymore they're seeing it more in, on social media and seeing sort of the results that surgical intervention can provide and they're drawn to it well, especially when they're watching the celebrities doing it at a younger age as well. Right. Um, I just think, though, psychologically, if they're already struggling now at 33, wait till they're in their 40s and 50s and 60s. Trust right. me, it's going to be way, I mean, I don't know, they're going to shoot themselves, you know. <laughs> like, you know if they're, I just wonder about that. Like, you, they, it's not like you're going to have a facelift at 35 and you're good to go, you know. Right. And there's a lot more that happens after that called, you know, aging. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so is there, I know you are, you have a lot of competitors around there. Is there any other way or um, strategy you're using to differentiate yourself from the others? Um, the, the, the sort of the patented uh, surgical uh, procedure was a great one that, that did it. The um, I, I'm in an area where it's a very highly sort of ethnic area where uh, there's a lot of rhinoplasties going on. And not too many people doing rhinoplasty in my area. Good point. Um, so, you know, that I never even needed to advertise for. And we're doing, you know, 220 rhinoplasties a year. And I'm, oh, not, I'm, I'm not doing any sort of advertising for it. Where I am spending a little bit of advertising dollars is my aging face population. Because it seems that everybody fights over that. You know, the, the, the full body plastic surgeons, the facial plastic surgeons, even dermatologists are fighting over, you know, lifts and, and things of that nature. So uh, we, we do spend a little bit of money there, but nothing to even write home about. And um, it's worked. It's been consistent advertising towards that patient, consistent putting information out there, consistently having 
Facebook Lives or Instagram Lives, doing Q and A's, um, you know, from my own office, whether it's in, you know whether people are here or not, and constantly putting out you know before and afters, and it's it's working or, or it's up you know forty percent over last year, just being consistent with it, and um, it's great, and that along with the the Zoom boom, people not wanting to look at their necks. It sort of just coincided that, you know, you can, you know, that, that practice has grown. Um, I, I, I was watching one of your Facebook lives and I was thinking, okay, for social media, you have somebody on board, which I think you have to have in today's world. Um, not just like the roving reporter in the office, but you also need somebody who knows how to video edit because Correct. they can make you look great, you know, especially if you're not into it and you're not like, you know, you've never wanted to be an actor. Um, they can they can really add some music, some highlights. Um, you can get by almost without talking because they can put in the quotes, you know, or just right. fun things. Um, so I think that's going to be imperative for everybody in today's world. Google's take Google's not letting anyone get to your website anymore. I'm just no. watching how brutal that's gotten. They I, I guess they just want to own the homepage for themselves. And um, you don't even have to leave the homepage because all the answers are right there. And right. So I think, what the heck are you guys going to do to find new patients if they keep like closing all those doors? Yeah, that's all. It's all those algorithms. And I have, you know, you know, I keep asking my my college roommates back in the day. They, you know, most of them went to work, go work for Meta or Facebook or Google. They don't really have an answer for it. I don't. I, I, they're just trying to keep things proprietary. I guess I don't. I have no clue. But in, in going back to having somebody in your office, it's it's very important that you invest in them and allow them to take classes on how to market on the internet. And so we're constantly doing that with our, my, my patient care coordinators doubles as my social media manager, and then, you know, farms the work out to every, you know, other people in the office. And she's constantly taking classes and constantly knowing how to, you know, beat the algorithms and things like that. So um, it's important to invest in, it's definitely important to invest in something like that. Oh, in today's world, I, I mean, I have an MBA, I have a BS and an MBA. And quite frankly, I've learned more on buying courses at night that I watch online than I ever did in school that took years and years to learn. Like right. even that marketing nowadays, you're not learning a full on foundation of things. You're learning one thing. How do you do a Facebook ad? Boom. How do you do a LinkedIn ad? Boom. Like that's so easy. Just go to YouTube. I mean, you don't tell me everything you ever wanted to know. It's exactly. You, you have to want to put the effort in, you know, is that's the, the secret to it. <laughs> you know, you have to want to do that. True. Um, but if you've got staff who like to do that, they want to grow, it's more fun for them. And I've noticed, have you noticed social media is look, it's coming like um, it's becoming a team player event. Like it, it builds camaraderie. Have you? Well, everybody wants to get involved because it's it's fun and it's you know you can do you know I'm not I'm never going to be the dancing guy or anything like that. But I'll, if, sure? if, <laughs> if the um, you know if the other staff want to do that and have fun with it, I've got no problem. You know, let your you know, let your personality show through. People want to know that you're a real person, not a robot. You know, so you have to incorporate you know not just your treatments, but you know things that are going on in the office. You know, we. And we, you know, post about our outings and, you know, whatever it may be, you know, you have to let people know that there's real humans here who are, who are doing the work. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's fun. You know, most people, most everybody wants, I don't have a single, not one that doesn't, one, well, one that doesn't like being <laughs> in, in front of the you know camera, you know, I'm, I'm not crazy about it, but I do it because I know it serves a purpose. But most people do want to, you know, help out in that regard. Would you say social media is like one of those marketing channels that you're focused on? Or is something else working better than that? Well, you know, social media for one, um, but what really works for me is that I've I've done surgeries on people who are in in, in this area who are in a very tight knit community. There's a, there's a few. Um, and it's mostly, mostly word of mouth between them. They have like these these communities have Facebook groups on their own, asking about who's the best rhinoplasty surgeon. Who do you see for this? I had no clue that this was happening until a mom showed me, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I have no clue. It's like an underground network of, of questions and answers for plastic surgery. But that happen if this is happening here, it's happening everywhere. And so you break into one of those communities and become the go-to guy. I mean, it sort of just spreads like white wildfire. It's like your own little real self, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> and you, 
get one, you can get that whole darn group. You know, right. they all are connected. They hang around together. If you could give them that one procedure that they want, um, like like get known for that one, like the rhino. Right. Um, boy, you are golden. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Good for you. Is there um, is there anything that you used to do for marketing that now just does not work anymore? Well, I never put anything into print per se, um, and um, you know, we 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 used to do more stuff on like sponsored links or sponsored stuff on Real Self, and I've quit all that. I quit all that maybe four years ago. I wasn't seeing any real from that platform itself any real leads coming through that were really good. Um, so the, the advertisement on real self, I've, I've shied away from, I still have a, I keep a real self link and things like that. Um, but we've been doing our own sort of reaching out to our patients through our social media and, uh, encouraging reviews, encouraging testimonials, encouraging video testimonials, encouraging patients to, you know, post about their journey with me and things like that. And they'll do it on TikTok and then they'll share it with us. So they'll go on Reddit. I didn't even know there was a plastic surgery, Reddit plastic surgery. I was, I was amazed. You know, you know, your patients and your prospective patients are are reaching out on every platform known to man, looking for some looking for answers, looking for real life sort of experiences with you. And so, you know, you want to encourage your patients to to post on those. So you can organically grow and you, it costs you no money other than asking them to do so. And a lot of people are scared to, to say that, but I encourage you to say, please, please tell us about your experience because I know we're striving to provide, you know, a world-class experience here. For sure. Um, for the Facebook Lives, has that been helpful to you, profitable? Yes, very much so. You know, so we'll 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 go back and we'll analyze to see, you know, how many consults, you know, if you know, two hundred people book, you know, sign up, how many are actually showing up and watching it, how many are booking a consult from there. But it's been a good, it's been a good, you know, sort of pass through and thoroughfare of reaching more people. You know, some people are just sort of scared to come in the office. Some people are very hesitant to even make a consult. You know, you're just trying to maybe tip somebody in the right direction and let your personality come through and let them see who you are as a person and what, what maybe your surgical beliefs are. And that, you know, that's is its weight in gold. I mean, that will get people in the door. Well, you know how I can tell when I look at your Instagram and, you know, you can see the likes, they um, like dramatically increase the more interactive you're being with that audience and those aren't easy to do those facebook lives if you're not used to sitting in front of a camera and living that can be very unnerving um (laughs) you guys are doing a great job of that but um often i say to the surgeons practice at home get in front of your cell phone and just get used to talking to a screen right you know just so to lighten up you know because the whole point is they need to see you as a caring funny nice kind compassionate person human being and however you can get that to come across because you can't when you're so stiff <laughs> yeah, right right i mean uh, lo- long gone are the days of the sort of the patriarch doctor who sits there and is like uh, i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do that and that's what we're doing it's that's gone i mean it's 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 the way of the, of the dodo bird you have you have to be engaged and you have to be you have to come out of your comfort zone you have you have to do things you have to get in front of the camera or else it's you're, you're, everybody else is going to be doing. You're going to be left on the side of the road if you don't. That's uh, you know what? That's frankly the, your words of wisdom. If you don't adapt to this new way of um, nurturing, educating, attracting patients, you are going to be left on the wayside because they're they're not going to tolerate less than that. Right. And, um, boy, the more uncomfortable you are, the happier the patient is. So just. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what would we, do you have any like last uh, words of wisdom for anybody who, let's say, is um, trying to make that jump that you made years ago um, to get into cosmetic? Um, anything you could tell them? You know, it, it takes uh, it takes belief in yourself. But, you know, the best person to bet on, the best thing to bet on is yourself because you can control that. You can put the work in. So bet on yourself. And if you do and you put the work in and you surround yourself with great people around you, you will succeed. Yeah. And my last fun question is, tell us something we don't know about you. 
Uh, when about, uh, let's see how long ago was this? It was 20 years ago or so. I ran with the bulls in Pamplona. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> That's a big deal. Yeah. I was scared and I was at the front of the pack, but I did it. <laughs> Were you a runner? Yeah. I mean, like, are you good at running? Like, oh, uh, I, well, um, not so much anymore. My knees aren't that great, but I, I have run a couple half marathons and did triathlons for a right. while. So. Because I hear you better not, you know, have a few beers and think you're going to jog along. Well, with I, I did have a few, and that's why I was at the front of the line. Okay, forget that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you survived that. That is very interesting. I've never yeah. heard that one before. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zuliani, for um, coming to Beauty and the Biz. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you soon at one of our conferences coming up. And everybody, um, if you want to talk to Dr. Zuliani for whatever reason, his website is ZulianiMD.com. Gotcha. Okay. And then if you want to uh, give me any feedback or questions, you can always give me a message on my website at KatherineMailey.com uh, or you can always DM me at MBA. Thanks so much. And we'll talk again soon.